A subset of exam two synthesis type problems come from melonic ester syntheses. Now, this is what melonic ester looks like. It's two esters that share the same alpha carbon. And whenever you see a, an alpha carbon that has two carbonyls that share it, you have some very, very acidic hydrogens on that carbon. And that's the basis of how these syntheses work. Namely, if you use a base, these protons are very easily pulled off. Now, what base should you use? This is very important. The base that you use should always match the OR group of the ester. Because if you use a different base, for example, if I use OCH3 minus, well, OCH3 minus can pull off these hydrogens, but it can also attack the carbonyl. And if OCH3 minus does attack that carbonyl, if that OCH3 minus attacks the carbonyl, that carbonyl would swing up. And you would get O minus, the OCH3 that attached, and the OET that was there to begin with. And when that O minus swings down, it can kick out the OET. And so what you would end up doing is something called transesterification, <laughs> which means you're changing the OR group of your ester. You would end up getting, after two rounds of this, both of these would be replaced. You'd be left with OCH3 for both of those esters. And then that OCH3 could pull off a proton and make this negative. So this is the reason why whenever you're doing a melonic ester synthesis, make sure that the OR group is the same as your base. Because if you use a base that matches your OR group, even if this OET minus does attack this carbonyl, when this swings up and swings back down, the only thing it could ever kick out is an OET. So if you're just adding another OET, you're kicking out whatever you added. Okay, so that's step one. Use a base, and what that base will do is since it can't kick out the OET, eventually it's gonna grab this proton. And then there are two ways of drawing this next step. You can either just draw from the carbon hydrogen bond to the carbon that hydrogen is attached to, and that would give you this. It, that carbon where the hydrogen was attached will be negative. OET, OET, and you have a minus charge on this carbon. Now remember why this minus charge wants to form. Because it can resonate down with that carbonyl. So I'd have a resonance structure that looks like this. OET. And enoate. Okay? And of course this can resonate to the left as well. So the other way you could draw your first step is to show how we got to this resonance structure rather than just putting the negative charge on the carbon. And the way you would do that is the first arrow is the same, the base is still pulling off that proton, but the electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bond go down to where the carbon-carbon double bond is forming, and the electrons of the oxygen swing up. And so now you have an enolate. Either way, what this will do next is typically in a synthesis problem, you want to add carbons to this spot in the middle, and this negative charge is going to help you do it. What you'll have is the second step over your arrow will be some carbon chain with a leaving group on it, bromine or chlorine, typically it's a halogen. And what happens is that negative charge will attack the carbon and kick out the bromine. So if you do this with the negative charge on the carbon, so this one, you just draw from the carbon that's negative to the carbon with the bromine and draw the bromine getting kicked out. And if you're working with the enolate, the way you would draw it is the O minus swings down. Remember, with enolates, the O minus almost never attacks anything. It's always the carbon-carbon double bond that attacks. And this resonance stru structure shows you which carbon is the carbon that things get uh, that does the attack. You draw from the double bond, but you know that this is the carbon on the end that's doing the attack. And so that would attack the carbon with the bromine on it, and the bromine would get kicked out. Either way, the result is the same. You reform the carbonyl, and now you attach however many carbons were attached to the bromine. So I have one, two, three. So what I should expect to get at the end of these two steps is the esters being the same, OET, OET, and then I have one, two, three. So that should be what I expect to get. 
Now, there's a second step that ch generally follows the, uh, the melanic ester synthesis. So there are two pairs of arrows you're going to see a lot when you're working with melanic ester. The first one we just discussed, the one where you see step one, step one, N-A-O-R, where the R group matches the R group of your ester. And that would be step one. And then step two would be some carbon chain with a leaving group on it. This is almost always paired together when you're working with melonic ester synthesis. So if you ever see this on an exam, generally it's going to be involving something like this. I won't say always, but very commonly it will. To further accentuate that this is involving a melonic ester synthesis, usually there's another set of arrows, or set of steps that are on one arrow, or in order of each other. Or, well, like this. Step one, OH minus. Step two, H plus or H3O positive, either or, doesn't really matter. And step three, E. When you see these three together, the thing, you, what you should be thinking about is decarboxylation. Uh, huh. Decarboxylation. And when you do decarboxylation, first what happens is The OH minus will do exactly what we talked about when we said you need to use the same OR group. That OH minus will attack your carbonyl. It'll swing up, and the OET will get kicked out. And it's going to do that to both of these. So after one step of OH minus, or well, technically two, you would be left with two carboxylic acids. Now remember, OH minus is a base. And we have, as long as we're in step one, we have a lot of that base floating around. And carboxylic acid, well, it's in the name. It's an acid. And that means this OH minus can very easily pull off protons from this oxygen and make it negative. And even if it doesn't pull off the oxygen hydrogens, we have really acidic hydrogens here that could get pulled off. Either way, there's a reason why we have step two H plus or H zero positive, and that's to make sure that whatever gets deprotonated isn't deprotonated when we finish our reaction. So we have some H0 positive, that oxygen can grab a proton, and now we have our fully protonated carboxylic acid. So very commonly, people see these three reactions in re together and say, OK, this is all decarboxylation. No, the only step that does decarboxylation is heat. All you need is heat. But then there are some prior prerequisites you need to actually cut that carboxylic acid off. These two reactions, one and two, are used together to turn an ester into a carboxylic acid. So you turn an OR group into a carbonyl with an OH group. Okay? And then decarboxylation, how does that work? What you're going to do is you're going to find your carboxylic acid and you're going to label that carbon one. Then you're going to go a single bond over to an alpha carbon, and then a, a third bond over. That third carbon has to have a C double bond O on it. Doesn't matter if it's an ester double bond O, an, an ester's double bond O, or a carboxylic acid's double bond O, or an aldehyde or a ketone. But there has to be a C double bond O there. Otherwise, nothing gets chopped off. But in this example, there is. So I'm going to say, okay, so I have my carboxylic acid numbered one, my alpha carbon two, and my my beta carbonyl, that's what this would be called, three. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a dotted line through one and two. And that's going to be where my carboxylic acid gets chopped off. So after I apply heat, what I will get is now carbon three and two are still perfectly intact. Nothing changed about them. But carbon one has now become detached from carbon two as a CO2 molecule, carbon dioxide, which looks like a carbon with two double bond O's on it. So here's carbon one. So most commonly, when you, if you see these reactions in conjunction with each other, you are most likely working with something reminiscent of this. Okay, so now let's get some practice problems to try.